Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Bissell. I'm Liz Manischel. This week we have editor Terrilyn Shropshire on the show to talk about editing the new Netflix film, The Old Guard. Oh my god, so excited. I love this movie. It was a lot of fun. It's also, it was crazy because I never heard of it and then I was in Los Angeles and I looked up and there was a gigantic billboard on a building like a huge banner of uh you know charlie Theron with this for this movie and i was like oh my god this is a big deal i have to i should see this so i have that kind of sensibility of not necessarily gravitating towards a genre but gravitating more towards something that i love watching but Terrilyn talks to us about uh, how she approached editing a modern day superhero film and then she talked about like how she got started, and then she talked about what her path as an editor was, and then a little bit about her process. And she kind of breaks down one of the, the best scenes in the movie and like how she approached it um, as uh, from an editorial standpoint, which was like really, really cool. Also, she's just, I call her a movie hero. She's just the one of the best interviews we've ever done. I was so excited to talk to her. Super encouraging and just, just a blast. But before we get to, to Terry, yeah. We got some stuff going on in the world, but wait, hello, it's not news, it's an announcement. Listen to me, television is not the truth. We'll tell you anything you want to hear, we lie like hell. So it's pretty cool. We haven't really done a show update in a while, but uh, Liz, do you want to do the honors? Do you want to tell people about this thing? Oh yeah, we're starting a YouTube channel. (laughs) Oh my God. Wow. Incredible. So for those listening, you may not know that we're also recording video at the same time, and that video is going to be moved over and uploaded to YouTube channel so you can see the shows in addition to listening to the shows. And I think we even have some fun um, ancillary content like Ulrich going to the grocery store that should be up there. (laughs) Right. Yeah, we're doing these little promos. Where we're talking about, you know, the uh, the the show and like the really the most important thing with this new YouTube channel is that in order to launch it, we have to get a certain amount of subscribers before September in order to like really have the channel look the way we want it to look because they give you extra, you know, uh, features and access to controlling your page once you hit that many subscribers. So really, like we need your help to get to 100 subscribers in order for the show to actually launch. So I don't know what will happen if we don't get them. I, I mean, I'm just assuming we're going to get 100 in, in a month. But if it doesn't happen, we may have to delay the release of the show. So let's make I sure I mean, I'm going to create 97 more email addresses <laughs> if we don't gather 100 people. Yeah, I mean, we have well over, uh, you know, 600 listeners a week, maybe even more like 1,200 sometimes. So, I mean, come on. If it's, if it's really 1,000 people who listen a week, like 100 of you guys, you can subscribe, right? Like, that's not so hard, is it? Like, But what what are you excited about, do, like, having a video side of it, Liz, besides just doing the audio? Like, what's interesting Ugh. to you about that? Ugh. Um, uh, nothing. Um, I have to do my hair. I have to, um, look at people. No, I actually do really enjoy being able to see the guests. Cause I think before you, I would kind of like stare at the corner of my room and just kind of like imagine what they looked like. But this time you get to see if they're laughing at your jokes, you get to see if you struck a nerve, you get to see, I, I love that. So I think it's made, it's given the show more life. What do you, what do you feel? I, I, I agree with all that. And I also really like the personal connection side of it because like you're saying, like you get to see their reactions to the question and you get to sort of know them a little bit better through the video. So I feel like not only does um, it help with like asking questions, but I, I think it, it helps you decide when to ask a certain question and like what kind of question you can ask. Like, I think it kind of opens up the game a little bit because sometimes on the audio, you can you can sort of misread silence or certain, you know, responses as like disinterest. And then maybe you're like, oh, well, I shouldn't ask this next question because maybe they don't actually want to talk about this or whatever. But when you have the video, you can read them better and you can be like, feel a little bit of more of a connection. And then maybe you can ask a, a more personal question, you know, um, if it's appropriate. Right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And also, I think just in general, if I if I were a guest, I would feel more comfortable talking to someone if I was seeing their face, too. Right. Like, right. It goes both ways. And I, I feel like now like that everyone's so used to Zoom because of the pandemic and like video conferencing is like become, you know, a really a pretty standard part of our society that like it's sort of silly not to do it, you know, like we, like, it feels kind of like, oh, we're not doing zoom. Like we've, I think we've had people like ask us before, like, oh, it's not on on video too, you know, like, (laughs) like kind of confused, like why it wasn't. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I just think it's a good thing. And, um, I think like, I'm really interested to see what the reaction is, is to it. Like if like people are gonna really flock to the YouTube channel more to watch the show, um, if that becomes a new way to listen to it or if they'll, you know, want to listen to it like in their car and then watch it later to like if they listen to it again or something. I don't know. I'm just curious. We'll find out. Ulrich, you've got mail. My breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You've got mail. Oh, wow. Okay. What do we have this week, Liz? Lonzo Bentley wrote... The world's kindest customer review of making <laughs> movies is hard. <laughs> oh, and I will read it and then get uncomfortable because I read it last night and I just like my whole night was made. Subject is the truth is in the title. And again, five stars, but looks like six because of my horrible eyesight. Making movies really is hard. I've been listening to this podcast since episode 20 odd or even something. And I must say, it just keeps getting better and better. Like a well-written, long-writing TV show. It has been thrilling and inspiring to see the journeys of Timothy, Ulrich, and Liz. By the... Okay, this is... <laughs> this is where I get really uncomfortable. By the... And I can't believe I elected to read this. Uh, <laughs> by the way... <laughs> Okay, he just, I basically, I don't even need to read it. because. No, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it for you. By the way, Liz Manischel is one of the most kind and genuine human beings I've ever interacted with. I've learned a great deal from Liz, and she continues to inspire me. You take over. Okay, Ulrich is pretty cool, too. Yay! (laughs) Uh, No, he goes on to say, Ulrich, you are really a great guy. Can't wait to buy the alternate. I truly believe this podcast is essential for all independent filmmakers out there. Liz and Ulrich are providing some of the most valuable content for us, and it doesn't cost a thing. That being said, join the Patreon, folks. Liz and Ulrich, the indie film community is forever indebted to you. I'll be sure to thank you both during my Oscar speech. Yeah, so I don't know how you know Lonzo, but I was trying to track it down. I feel like he and I have like... um, we exchanged emails like a few years ago and just kind of like talked about our projects and just talked and then it turned into a Facebook friendship and then like I think he may be helping out on the horror film I make like I don't even know it just turned into this evolution (laughs) but he's just like first of all you should everyone should follow Alonzo on social media because it's the most entertaining timeline he's so nice and so talented and supportive and I just I wish the best for him do you how do you know Alonzo? So I think from the podcast. So he's been listening for a really long time. He, I think he has written us emails too. And uh, he's done a lot of commenting um, on Facebook and elsewhere. And so he's just kind of become part of the show's like, you know, fan base, I suppose. And I've had really great interactions with Lonzo. And I think, I believe he supported the alternate um, crowdfunding campaign. So thank you, Lonzo. I'm pretty certain that he did. If he didn't, I'm sorry. I'm getting that wrong. But I'm pretty... <laughs> Without looking, I would say absolutely he did. And yeah, he's just this a really positive, creative individual. And he's like the perfect example of like what our guests are like. They're like filmmakers who are growing and doing their own things and having their own successes, but then also like listen to the show um, to find inspiration. And it's like, he's just a really cool guy. So thanks, Lonzo, for the really kind words. And even more so, he put his money where his mouth is. He said, join the Patreon, folks. And guess what? He joined the freaking Patreon. He is our newest backer. Uh, thank you so much, Lonzo. Really, really appreciate it. I'm not going to say what the number is, but it's generous. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate it. Oh, my gosh. And so, yeah, just, you know, I'm flattered and thrilled. And what a what a great thing to say. And I'm just really glad that he's a part of our, our community with the show it's awesome so if you want to be like Lonzo Bentley you can send us a question comment or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com or just leave an iTunes review which is what he did or you know comments on Spotify I really I was looking at Spotify for comments for a while and I think there are a couple on there but um, yeah maybe we should start reading some Spotify comments because that would be pretty good you know too we also have a Patreon page as we said so if you love the show as much as Lonzo does or even half as much you should go over <laughs> to www.patreon.com slash M. MIH podcast and give us a buck 
Five bucks, nine dollars, and if you do the nine dollars, you'll get one of our brand new enamel pins that Lucas Colshaw has been blasting on Instagram, which is great. Um, you know, because he should be really proud. It's a really awesome logo, and I'm really glad that it's getting out there in physical form. And then lastly, as we said earlier in the episode, we've got a new YouTube page, so jump over to Instagram and click the link in our bio. Uh, so you can subscribe and help us reach 100 subscribers by September so we can launch th this show properly. So you make movies, huh? I produce feature motion pictures. I got an idea for a movie. So it's time to talk about short films. This week we have a short film from a listener, Corey Thibert, who is also part of the filmmaking community, much like Lonzo. I've been getting comments from Corey, and I think maybe he sent us an email a long time ago, so he's been a part of the conversation. And he sent us a short film, and we wanted to share it with everybody and show, show people what he's been up to. So, Corey, talk about your film. Well, I'm mainly a theater artist. I've been writing, producing, and performing my own work for the past decade. But I also love filmmaking, but there are way more moving parts and way more boundaries to making a film. Way more than the independent theater that I make. But with my short film, Please, I just wanted to make a film with the resources that I had available to me. I see every short that I've done as a way to build up my own skill set as I lead up to making my first feature film, which COVID-19 has delayed, thank you. But for this project, I see Please as improving my editing, my film performance, my writing, comedic timing, pacing. I think short films have the power to be way more than that and can really make a strong impact in a short amount of time. Like other shorts of mine are bigger scale, I wait a year to be rejected by a bunch of film festivals, but for please, I just wanted to make this film and have it be available online for people to enjoy and start working on the next project. I didn't come up with any funds. We wrote it with our resources in mind. And I never want to have to wait for permission to create, I hate hoping for funding. I'm really fortunate to be in a creative community, like all my friends are artists, and they're all really talented. I co-wrote and performed it with my good friend Val Kotick. Uh, my brother did the sound and original music, my wife assistant directed. Everyone on set was somebody really close to me. You know, we're all artists, we all want to create. Most of us are not getting funding to create our dream projects, so it's a lot of fun to get into a room together and collaborate on something together. You know, we shot it in one day, we owned all the equipment except for the lights. When financial resources aren't available to me, it really inspires me to create something with what I have. I, I think really interesting work can come from those restrictions. I thought nothing would happen to my career, and nothing has. <laughs> in, in a positive way, I didn't, I didn't make this short with an intention to launch my career or as a sizzle reel for a feature film. I believe everything that I do is building onto my portfolio as an artist and sharpening different tools. You know, I've been writing and performing for over 10 years, and I know not to put too much weight on any one project or opportunity. Like, this was really fun to write and create, and part of the fun of this project is that I wasn't putting too many expectations on it. Apart from being something that people can enjoy and laugh at, we made the two characters pretty neurotic, I think consent and communication in any sexual relationship is really important. Even if it can be awkward or new or uncomfortable to talk about, you do need to have that conversation. Consent is sexy. So the film, Please, really interesting film, um, nice, fun, short. I, I thought it had a lot of interesting aspects to it. Um, Liz, what did you think? I feel like I'm the uh, target audience for something like this because <laughs> I love I love shorts that are like dialogue based, that are relationship, that are like smaller in scope. Um, and I love when their creators are on screen. Like those are like, that's like the mobile guard movement. Like there's all these things that I'm drawn to. So the film involves a little bit of kink, I would say, in a relationship. But what I when I first saw it, I was like, mm, if this was written by men and directed by men, then I don't know if I could really sit in and enjoy it because it's you know it's a woman asking to be treated in a certain way but when I saw that a female force had a massive impact in this film I thought okay well I'm on board which I, I get could be maybe a little bit bigoted but the point is that I didn't want to see a bunch of men be like women love to be hit that's a, we're gonna make a movie about that um but it's like what I love about the short is that it's unusual. You don't really see movies about something like this. It's sweet. It's intimate. There's like this cuteness, cleverness. And it's like something you could do in a weekend as a creator and get a lot of attention for. And not everything is said. And I enjoyed the pace. Uh, let's hear what you have to say. All right. All right. Well, I, I like the sparseness of it. Like kept it focused on the characters and the story and the dialogue. Because, you you know, you're saying it's like a dialogue heavy short. I thought, thought the ending was really nice and succinct. Like, it really, like, kind of brought it home, you know, in a nice way. 
and I, I thought the performances felt honest, which I really enjoyed too. But like, I do have a little bit of a negative thing. It's different than yours, which is interesting because I didn't think about that. Um, but obviously that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but I was a little confused by the setting. Like it felt like this should have been in a bedroom or on a couch or something, but it was kind of like in this hallway or like, you know, like in the entryway to their house is what it kind of looks like. But Maybe this was just the best looking place in, in their house that they could shoot in, or I don't know if there's another reason why they decided to do that, but I felt like the standing facing off of each other, you know, in this play, it just felt kind of play-like. I don't know, it, but maybe that's part of the intention. So I don't know. I would have put it on a couch or a bed, personally. And then lastly, I didn't get, I get that they didn't want to do nudity, but I felt like the underwear as the choice for their, you know, art, like their clothing was... I don't know, a little weird. Like it kind of felt like she, maybe she should have like a lot, like some lingerie on or a nightgown, and that maybe he'd have a tank top or I don't know. She was wearing lingerie. Was she? Or Wasn't she I thought it was just like a bra and 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 panties. But oh, you mean like 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 a negligee or something, stuff. like something okay. that was more like sexy time, you know? Like uh, a lot of us don't even own those things right. anymore. But True. yes, I don't. But I mean, you know, I just felt like it was very. Um, I don't know if utilitarian is the right word, but it just felt like it was like very per- like yes, we can't be naked, so we're gonna be in this underwear because it's the close to being naked that we can do, and use your imaginations, you know. But I don't know, I don't know. I just felt like those aspects of it. I get that. Yeah, I get like the criticism. I think though, for me, like the originality and the like the risk that they were taking for even making this, right outshined some of my more practical questions that I think you're getting at. Right. It also kind of feels like like all the decisions are specific. It's not like they did it because it's the best we have. It's almost like they did it because they wanted it to be this way. Like they wanted them to be both standing off in that, you know, that the way that they were. I'm curious to hear what other people think of the short and uh, you know, we'll have the link in in the show notes. Yeah, uh, help get this get some views. I think they have like 100 views on Vimeo and like 300 on YouTube, so let's help people see this thing. What about truth? What about the reality? What about the way the old ending tested in Canoga Park? This week for our players of the week, we asked filmmakers, what are they doing to survive or cope during the pandemic and the uprising? And we actually got a good number of responses this time. So I was very excited. So let's hear what people have to say. I just wanted to note that uh, one of our speakers didn't slate. So her name is Azade Nixade. And I hope I said that right. And she's the only one who didn't give her name. So that's who she is. And she seems to be a lovely storyteller. All right, enjoy. COVID-19 was the best thing that happened to me in a very long time. I had the time and the flow of money, that is my pandemic unemployment insurance, to work on my personal project. Uh, I bought a treadmill and I hired a productivity coach. And I spent eight or nine hours a day on my scripts, I finished the scripts of many drafts, and I finished the lookbook, development package, submitted to different grants and programs, and by the end of the quarantine, I was ahead of so many people just by focusing on myself and doing what was right. Uh, so they always say, in life, there is no negative or positive events. It's the story you tell yourself and how you respond to it that defines it for you. Hi there, I'm Miriam Gloin. In the industry, I am an actor, writer, producer, and sometimes director. I also work at a network, but I work in tech there. To answer the question, like, how am I dealing with the pandemic and the uprising and keeping productive and sane? Um, with the pandemic, I'm wearing a mask whenever I go out. I'm washing my hands constantly. I'm staying six feet away from people. I'm keeping my circle pretty small um, and only slowly opening up to different friends who I know have been doing the same things. In terms of the uprising, it's really hard to keep not be full of rage all the time because I, you know, I really care about people and I want everyone to feel safe and and I know people don't. So I have been hounding Congress for more reforms for the police, as well as um, I have gone to some protests, the smaller ones more in my neighborhood so that I can still be COVID safe and be masked and six feet away from people. 
but it has felt good to know that people are mostly agreeing with the, the side of good despite the fascism from above. In terms of how I'm being productive, which is also helping me be sane. There's not a lot of acting going on and not a lot of filmmaking going on, although New York has opened production, so maybe that will change. But I have been writing a lot. Uh, I have written an animated pilot and two comedy pilots, and I am writing a feature film. I'm active in Film Shop and in Film Shop's Writer's Den, and um, just trying to keep happy and sane in this time, just like we all are. Thanks. Hi, my name is Yoko Okumura, Y-O-K-O-O-K-U-M-U-R-A. I am a director and a writer. With the question, how am I handling the pandemic and the uprising, I think the answer is going to be twofold, uh, one for each. Handling the pandemic is really about doing things one day at a time. And, um, you know, I'm a huge planner, but you can't really plan too much ahead right now as the future is unclear. So, you know, it's really rigorously planning out my week one at a time has really been important and keeping a schedule, you know, I, I work from 10 to 6 and actually sticking to that has been a source of maintaining sanity. You know, I've had a really lucky amount of remote directing gigs um, right now and the uh, managing the boundaries of that and my personal life within a home environment has you know been tricky as it is for everybody so regular schedule and planning is still my my go-to's to manage the pandemic but as far as the uprising goes i've just fully engaged in it as much as i can you know i've had it reminded to me that the skills we have as filmmakers is really we have a superpower and through my whole career i've been reminded of that that we have the power to shape people's cultural attitudes and change people's minds and that can be used for good or bad and so you know great powers comes great responsibility so we have an opportunity as filmmakers and storytellers to contribute to this uprising but also stop contributing to the you know to the to the negative media representations that perpetuate a lot of what we're fighting for and fighting against in this uprising so so yeah with the uprising that is that is how i've managed it is engage in it as much as possible evaluate all of my my work and future work in the lens of what is being fought for and um yeah thanks so much So today we're joined by Terlyn Shropshire, editor of The Old Guard, among many, many other amazing movies. Uh, welcome to the show, Terlyn. Thank you for having me. All right. So we start the show with, uh, you know, a rapid fire series of questions. I'll start. Um, this is all about editing The Old Guard. At what point were you brought on to the project? And other than your expansive experience, what you got you the job? I came on pretty early on it, even without, as an editor, uh, Gina, the minute she usually gets a script, I'm usually the second or third person I've, to read it. So I read it very early. It was really exciting. I had not read the graphic novel and uh, I had the ability to actually read the script and not know that these guys were immortal, which nobody gets to do. So I, I had that privilege. And I, I'm completely on it because of Gina and our year, 20 years together. And this was her next journey and she wanted me to be a part of it. So I have been really lucky to have done every single movie that she has done and she hasn't kicked me off yet. So that's, that's how I, I found myself on the old guard. How long was the whole experience editing? I was editing while they were shooting. So our entire process was about 13 months. So post ended up being about a little over 10 and a half. Of all the projects you've edited, can you compare this one to the rest? Was it harder, easier, more or less resources support? Well, Gina kept calling it a bigger sandbox, which I thought was a pretty cool example. I feel that all the films that I've done have had certain degrees of difficulty. Making a movie is hard, as you guys know. And so I would say this one had its challenges. It, it, it took different muscles, but then tools I've been using in other films, but just in different genres. So it was fun. It was challenging more than anything because the sheer amount of footage that was coming in, there was a ton of, ton of footage. 
so that made it difficult to try to just keep up with camera and making sure that I looked at everything because I can't not look at everything. So that that was the most challenging thing was being able to have the time to look at all the footage. And finally, how do you feel about the film and how it turned out? I love the old guard and I, I love the characters and it's my kind of, well, I call it an action drama. And I'm just relieved again that everybody has, has well, not everybody, but most people have embraced it and, and loved it as much as I do. Um, you know, you, you end up having an affection for all the films you work on. And this one is no exception. What inspired you to start in, in editing to begin with? I think it was my love of writing that, that it ultimately trans- transitioned me into an editor. I was a, I loved English uh, in high school. I loved, uh, I was a journalism major as well as a film major uh, when I went to USC. And while having to use both of those skills, I, I found myself gravitating more towards the editing aspect of both writing and filmmaking, as opposed to having to go out and like create a copy or come go out and create a film. I, I, I didn't particularly necessarily enjoy being out shooting and, and it, you know, it, it was a means to an end is what I discovered was, is I really loved being able to take all the material that I created and play with it, you know, in the privacy of my own editing space. And it just came natural, naturally to me. It, it felt organic. I was, the, I was the person that when, when people had papers, they would give them to me and they would say, what do you think? And I would say, well, if you move this sentence here and if you try this. So I just think it was something I was always doing. So when I finally went through the different crafts of going out and shooting and recording sound and directing and all of that, I felt more at peace, so to speak, when I was had everything in one space. And it was just me and the material and figuring out how to tell the story. So I think like every potential editor or aspiring editor listening to this podcast is probably looking at your IMDb and like looking at all your credits and just wondering like, you know, starting from a place where you know you want to be an editor, like how do you get your first break? Like how do you get your first movie to get you started? The first movies obviously came when I was still in school. And then you have those people who you who you graduate with who then are becoming filmmakers and they're asking you to help them cut their projects. But professionally for me, I you know, I came up the craft very much through the apprenticeship and assistant assistant editor editor and I worked with an editor who then became a director. And that particular editor was Ann Grosso. And we met on the two Jakes uh, that was directed by Jack Nicholson. And I was fortunate enough to come on as an additional assistant. And I ended up working on the film for about six months. And then I went on to work with other editors on their projects. But when <clears throat> Ann decided that she was going to direct, it was also a time when we were just kind of, um, we, had, we were into the digital world of Avid and less in the world of film. So she called me in to see if I was available to cut her first feature. And that was my first opportunity to kind of get out of the world of cutting shorts and um, assisting to actually becoming an editor on a feature. And then I ultimately cut the, the, the next two of her projects. So I wanted to ask about process, you know, and just talk about like how you approach editing a film. And I kind of wanted to hear like, is it the same every time or does it change with directors? Or are you always going in and just like throwing an assembly together? Like what's your process when you start on a project? Um, once I start picking the, you know, picking the selects, I might not necessarily always start at the beginning. There might be some particular part of the scene that when I watched the dailies, I was like, oh my gosh, wow. And, and it may be something that I may want to start with. Sometimes it will be at the beginning of the scene. Sometimes it's a scene that is so integral to something else that's about to come in that I may just kind of take a look at it, make sure that we have everything we ha- need and put that one away. Um, it just depends. Every you know, The situation changes depending on what's happening with the film itself. But obviously on something like The Old Guard, I'm constantly keeping up with camera or at least trying to, endeavoring to, because at any given point, I have to be able to communicate to Gina or a producer as to what I'm seeing or if there's anything additional that we need. Or they may be often second unit was going in right after first unit was finished in a particular location to grab certain things. And I had to be able to tell them 
you know, if there was something that I needed from them. And they also had questions for me. Sometimes they needed to see something that had been shot and I needed to do something quickly to, to show it to them. So my process is, is, is very kind of voyeuristically audience related where I try to forget what I know and I try to look at the dailies as an audience member and, and begin that kind of building of that story from that perspective. I was curious, though, you know, you talked a little bit about what draws you to material, but is there a genre that you're attracted to? Because I also saw, like, during the breadth of your career, it was like romance, heavy drama, you know, like superhero movie. Is it you wanting to jump from genre to genre, or are you attracted to these genres and wanting to delve into them? What, uh, where does the genre, genre that I, is my favorite is good movies. That that genre is my favorite uh, good storytelling. Um, look, I grew up watching everything. I watched Beach Blanket Bingo and I watched Mr. Roberts and, you know, I, I, I watched Seahawk and, you know, Swack Orphan. It, you know, it, there was, so, look, there was so much. When I was a kid, I'm such a geek. When I was a kid, I literally had a notebook that every time I watched a movie, I wrote it in my notebook, you know, Fidget Ghost, Hawaii or whatever it was. And so ultimately, growing up and going to movies, I went to all types of movies. So I have that kind of sensibility of really not necessarily gravitating towards a genre, but gravitating more towards something that I love watching. And when you when you receive a script, you hope that when you start to watch that script, that it's taking you into a world that that you want to see on the screen. So I don't feel like I have a particular genre that I love. Look, I grew up like watching, and I love musicals. I mean, I, I, I love, you know, I love all types of, I love Hitchcock. I, I, I love Western, death of the Western um, themes. And so no, I, I don't, I, there's not just one genre that I could just gravitate towards. I mean, look, I'm always jonesing for a really good love story. Uh, I think we all, have those, you know, have those moments where it's like, okay, what's going to be the next really great love story? I'd like to have the opportunity to do all types of films. And my my directors have given me that opportunity to follow them in terms of what lens they want to go into next. And I've been very, very fortunate. And I keep, you know, and I'm looking forward to whatever that next that next one is, and that it's a really good story. Because I, I, I don't take that for granted. I mean, reading a, a really well-written, thoughtful script is rare air, I feel. So The Old Guard's like a superhero action movie. And I was really curious to hear about your approach for the action sequences just to like how you tackle editing one of those, basically. And if it's any different than like, you know, any other kind you know, of scene. Action always has this kind of bravado, gee, it must be tough kind of reputation to it. And and I find that action is a different muscle of storytelling, right? And so when I think about those scenes, I, I kind of break it down to their base level of um, there's a certain choreography, there's certain movements to a scene that involves action, right? But ultimately, it's about, and especially in working with Gina, it's about why are we in this space? Why are these two people in a place, whether it's conflict or momentum, or why are they there in the first place? So often on a film like this, the, the work in production and pre-production and production is, is about the choreography, the choreography and getting, making sure that the, the actors are moving a certain way, striking a certain way and getting that down, right? So part of it is when you're building something like that on a very foundational base, you want to make sure that you are reflecting, reflecting the attention of the choreography, first of all, and that you're using the best of those movements that these stunt coordinators and the director and the actors have worked so hard to master, right? So there's just those pieces, right? But then ultimately those pieces are there to tell a story. There's a reason why we are moving through this particular scene. And if there isn't, it should be in the movie, right? So for me, it's really about making sure that I have taken the best actions, the best movements, the best choreography and build it in such a way that that's down. 
right? I have those pieces. But within those pieces, where is the emotion? Where is the emotion in the punch? Where is the emotion in somebody running or, or, or someone moving or fighting against one another? You know, where is the balance to the scene? What is the scene about? That's how I kind of approach it. And if you look at something like, if you want to even take something like the plane fight in, in, in uh, the old guard, it's, it's, it, yes, it's two badass women who, have, who are, are really doing their best to take each other down. But if you really think about it, you know, Andy, who has lived for millennia, right? She, she, and has every, you know, fighting style available to her at this point, could have taken Niall down at, at any point, right? And so at a certain point, you, rec- you recognize that she's testing Niall. The point that she's trying to get through this scene is she wants to see what Niall's made of. The point of Niall is that she wants to take Andy down. She's scared. This woman is kidnapped her. She doesn't know what's going on. And so within that fight, yes, you have the the actual physical element of that fight you have to build. But what you really have to build is the back and forth emotionally as to what these people are going through and what their goal is. That's how that scene is approached. And I feel like with every action scene, whether it's something in the old guard or, you know, something that I've done in the Spala or or Biker Boys or whatever, there there is a reason for the action. And I think that sometimes younger editors may get caught up, too caught up in worrying about the cuts themselves and the actual, but I think when you start really focusing on what the scene is there for, that the the editing of it actually gets much easier if you kind of get out of your, get out of the minutia at times. Yes, you have to kind of be very technical and very specific about elements of the action, but I think there are times when you need to step out of it and remind yourself, what is the purpose of the action? I have a quick follow-up question to that. When you're editing a sequence like that, are, do you have a pre that you're working off of or a storyboard? Or do you kind of just throw that away and just do your own version? Yes. And yes. <laughs> um, I have generally, um, it'll start with a storyboard. And then I start to get a pre in of the um, actual fight itself, what the choreography is, the A, B, C, you know, let's say stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And in many ways, that's how the actors are actually learning the fight. They're learning it in different pieces. I will get that. And often that is a definitely a roadmap as to what the fight is supposed to look like. You know, what, when she's supposed to do this particular move or that particular move. What it doesn't necessarily, it tells you the intention, right? What the intention is. So then once they get on set and they actually shoot, shoot that intention, the difference, what happens is you're literally going from a pre where every single person that's doing the pre is physically showing you the move. But what they're not showing you are the emotions. You know, they're not actors. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you know, I'm, there are some very lovely uh, some people who can act very well. But I'm just saying they're there. It's there to show both the actors and the director the choreography that they have designed, right? What it doesn't give you is it doesn't give you the beat. It doesn't give you the emotion. It doesn't give you those moments of when do you have someone throw a hit, have someone receive the hit, and then react to the hit, right? When do you allow for a pause? in the fight, you know, or, or, or not. And so uh, it definitely is your roadmap, but I find myself taking that roadmap, honoring it from the sense of a, the choreography of it. And at the same time, you know, there are lovely things that happen when you're making movies and you have act, two actors in a, in a closed off space. Like you're not gonna necessarily see when Niall hits Andy, finally gets a, a good punch, and Andy kind of steps back and does like this a little trip. You know, that's not something that comes from a pre You know, those, those, you know, is, once the actors take on those, those characters, and they go full physical, a lot of amazingly wondrous things happen that you then weave into the fight itself. And they bring the emotion and they bring that physical, I don't know, energy to a scene that a previs previs doesn't. Departing slightly, sorry, I have a off-topic question. 
I just think post is the best part of filmmaking and I, I love it so much. And I do often think that it, it is a little bit therapy just between the editor and the director because the director may be working out things that they didn't get and I often find my editor trying to make me feel better <laughs> <laughs> and like trying to like create some solutions. Have you found yourself in that scenario where you're trying to convince a director or remind a director of everything they've done? That's great. Do you have to be that kind of force for them or do you choose to be uh, that force? Yes, yes. I mean, absolutely. I mean, getting a film finished made Frankly, shooting a film and getting through production, I, I, I don't know how they how sometimes directors do it. It's, you feel like it's just sheer will to get to the cutting room, you know, to be able to kind of finally get to the cutting room. And often when they arrive, they are exhausted. You know, they've gone through this transformative experience. And um, often uh, I, I usually hope that they wait and I, I don't see them for a good two weeks, like go climb a mountain, go, you know, go to the Maldives or something, because you want them to be able to clear their head before they come to you. Because ultimately, you've been living with this material for the entire time they, they, they're still shooting. So you're kind of at a point now, it's like, okay, they're finally coming in, and I have a cut, and I'm ready to get to work. And they're still thinking about when they're watching the film, oh, that was the day the generator worked, or that was the day I had an issue with the actor or whatever it is, they're still living it. And so you have to, you have to allow them to kind of decompress, right? And part of that decompressing is at times where they're just still batting themselves. Like, oh my God, that was the day I forgot to do this. And it's, it's literally like this. And, you know, you have to kind of sit through that and you know, eventually they'll catch up to you. And at a certain point, I will say, put the bat down. It's time to put the bat down and let's get to work. You know, because editing rooms are always about solutions. We've been living with the problems. I mean, look, I mean, from the moment that stuff comes in, you are either extremely happy or extremely like what or somewhere in between. And then you have to put that aside because it's about solutions. So for me, it's, I love my relationships with directors and I understand to the degree that I can be sympathetic to where they are when they come in. And you have to be patient. Patience is one of the superpowers I feel that editors have, hopefully the good ones, because it, it takes every degree of patience on those days when you're like, I'm ready to work. And can we figure out the scene? Can you get, get out of your head for a minute? And let's work. But sometimes you, you know, we're, we're organisms and life comes in and you have to be able to balance the life and you know, being sometimes the psychologist and being the editor and being the 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 friend and being those people, you know, and, and it works both ways. I mean, we, you know, you hope that they help us too. You know, we give them perspective. They give us perspective. Some days we're like, oh my gosh, we just don't have, we're not gelling and, and, and they, and they inspire you to keep going. So in the healthiest of relationships, of course. So I had a question about finding your next project and, and deciding to make the commitment to work, especially with like a new director. What would you want to hear in order to like say yes to, you know, a new, a new film with a new team? Because like I know with your old collaborators, that's probably easier. But when you're talking about working with someone new, like what's that conversation like? Well, I mean, for me, it's really about the story that they want to tell. And I look forward to, I love meeting new directors. I, I'm inspired by so many up and coming directors and directors who are working out there and doing really cool things. And so for me, what I hope is, is that I get a script that excites me the way Eve's Bayou excites me or Love and Basketball excited me or The Old Guard. And then once I get that script, I'm always really excited to meet the person who's going to tell that story. And Generally, when I go in and I get the opportunity to go in for a meeting, I, I usually just want to talk to them about story because ultimately that's what we're going to be working on if it's a project that I get to, to work on. So when I'm meeting at the director, I, I, I really want to get a sense of who they are and they want to get a sense of who, who I am. And look, by the time I go into a meeting, you can pretty much guess that everybody else that's coming into that meeting can cut right? And otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to get in the room in the first place. So the question really becomes getting to know one another. And I want to hear from the director, what 
how they feel about the script. What do they feel like their challenges are? What is their intention? What, how, you know, what are the things that are exciting them about the fact they're about to go into production? You know, what do they, um, how do they like to work? All the, you know, all those things. How do they feel about music? Sometimes the best conversations are when you're not even just talking about the script, but you're talking about, oh, what have you been watching? And, and, you know, what, what filmmaker inspires you? Is there a particular film that, that, this particular film you're about to do, what have you been using kind of as your mood board and having those conversations. And, um, and I just like to hear directors that are passionate about what they're doing and have a really cool vi visual sensibility and have a sense of humor and, and to some degree are, are looking for a collaborator and not a pair of hands. I mean, if I, if, if, if you're a director and, and you're literally not wanting to use the tools that I have to share with you, I'm not your person. I, I'm not looking to be somebody's pair of hands. I'm looking to be someone who can help you give perspective to what you're doing. And I want you to give perspective to what I'm doing and recognize that we're both storytellers, right? I know we're winding down, but I would love to hear if you have a favorite cut that you've ever made. A favorite cut? Wow. That is a, ooh. Or if there's a favorite cut that you've ever seen in a movie where you're like, oh, that's you know, a good it's cut. funny because I mean, I, I love all my cuts now. Of course, I can't think of the old guard right now. And the minute we hang up, I'll think of, oh, that that moment and that moment <laughs> and that moment. I love that moment. I think that um, sometimes I go back to love and basketball uh, because one of my favorite things to do, and I didn't really have so much of it on, in this movie at all, actually, is I love montages. One of my favorite montages, even to this day, it's funny because it's hard to go back and watch your movies. I mean, I think a lot of editors say that it takes a minute. But there are times when I, I will be channel surfing and on whether it's stars or something to come on and then I'll see Love and Basketball. And there's a montage that I did where it really talks about the struggle that Monica was having to make it you know, on the team. Meanwhile, Quincy is ultimately um, rising. He's like the rising star. And to this day, I still can sit and watch that montage and just smile, you know? Um, and I just, I love the transitions, how we went back and forth from Quincy to Monica in, in, in the montage itself. Those are some of my favorite cuts. I would say with the old guard look, every, the scene that everybody loves is the airplane scene. One of my favorite scenes is I love the dinner table scene. I love the scene where Niall is hearing the stories about Joe and Nikki and, and where you get to see a vulnerability in Andy. That's one of my favorite scenes. It's not one that people often talk about, you know, when they're talking about the movie, but, it, but having the old guard sitting, having dinner and talking about the good old days is one of my favorite scenes that I cut. So I know we're supposed to get to our final five questions, but I, I'm actually in the middle of editing my first feature and I wasn't fortunate enough to be able to have my own editor. So I actually directed, wrote, and I'm editing too. So I just want to take the opportunity to ask you for any advice you may have and like, you know, trying to finish this movie up. I'm kind of in the fine tuning st stages of editing right now and I'm trying to get a cut out this weekend. So yeah, any tips? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the fact that you're editing your own thing is going to make you so much a better director. I think if you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> um, but what okay. I would say is, is as you're getting your film finished, are you showing it to anybody to give you some perspective? Because when you're in that bubble, as that director, editor, I'm doing it all, you, I, I still encourage you to find somebody's opinion who matters to you and have them take a look at it. And I would say also, you have to be, and I told this to Gina when we first worked together, and I got such a horrified look from her, but she's come to understand what I said is you have to be the most ruthless with yourself. You know, uh, there are times when there are those babies that you just love that you have to be able to let them go and, or at least dwell, I always say dwell in the what if. I mean, if there's something you're not sure about, there's something that's not quite working, something that, you know, the thing about it is, again, I'm a walking cliche. I say, at first, you don't succeed, destroy any, you know, evidence that you tried. Go ahead and try those things that you would never imagine doing. Nobody's watching. You know, the, that the editing room is a safe space for you to try, for you to fail epically, 
and nobody has to ever see that, right? So give yourself the freedom to be ruthless, to be, to just, you know, try things that you would never have tried. And then allow yourself to be vulnerable, open it up to somebody whose opinion that you, that matters to you and, and get some fresh perspective outside of your head space. I love it. I, I have been sharing the movie. Liz has seen it. Yeah, and, it's great. Uh, it's a great movie. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Not done yet. It's 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 get, it's getting there. Congratulations. Um, but yeah, no, thank you. Um, but yeah, I uh, I've been trying to. That's that's this next cut. I'm cutting a few. Actually, I'm cutting a whole storyline out of the movie that I was. I've been so like behind the whole time, and I've gotten some notes early, even in the script stage, to take it out. And uh, I've been ignoring them, and now I'm just gonna okay, just try it without it, just see what happens. So, we'll we'll see. Um, but let's get to the final five questions. Liz, you should go first. All right. So what's the, you already talked about this, but maybe you can elaborate. What's the first film you ever made or edited and how do you feel oh, about wow. it now? The first film I ever edited uh, professionally, right? Well, no, you could be um, in at, you know, in 290. It could be whatever. Okay. It could be. <laughs> um, well, look, the first film I ever edited was something that I directed and it was a, a, a 290, obviously. And it was something that it had to do with when I first came out to California. And I was so surprised by how it felt like so many young people out here were a lot more mature beyond their age. And I, I went out and I tried to shoot this story and I got in my editing room and it was, again, I, I felt like I was the worst filmmaker. How did I even get into film school? And my God, you know, I, I'm a failure. And then I had to show it to the class and it, and it was so embarrassing well these kids who literally came out of you know their mother with a camera in their hand were doing these amazing chase scenes to the library but what it taught me was that it gave me the the drive to get better and better and better and better and so even though that's the first memory of my editing it it it, it it's what gave me the drive to just keep improving and and being able to go back into that class a, a better filmmaker and being inspired by people that were doing it better than I did was and I wanted to be as good as them right and I think that's what inspires a lot of us is when we see a film or a filmmakers work and we're like we want to be as badass as they are and then we work towards it what's the best filmmaking advice you've ever mean received? what you say and say what you mean do you have a goal as an editor like um I don't know if it's a 45 million films that you want to edit or at an Oscar, but you know, whatever it is that you are I'm after. after. Well, I'm superstitious, so I don't talk about that awards kind of thing, but I really am after being able to walk into an interview on any type of film and either get it or not get it, but at least get access to the, to, to the opportunity to, to go for it. That's what I, I, that's, ultimately and then I joke because then I say and then when my second goal is to be one of those kind of Dee Dee Allen and Coates people that when you speak you know you're revered and people kind of listen to what you're saying that would be fun well we're listening yeah. Yeah, thank you we're listening. Yeah. <laughs> I think a few other people are too thank you. <laughs> yeah. if you could go back in time what's one piece of advice you would give yourself take a break and not worry about the next um, they do come. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like it's hard to go back because, you know, there's the lessons from everything that I've, that I've gone through has been a lesson. Right. But I would say just, you know, it, try to enjoy life while you're taking this journey. Don't get so worried about what the next job's going to be. Try to spend time, you know, just taking care of yourself and taking care of your life and enjoying the moment. Enjoy the moments. Don't worry too much about, you know, what's going to happen next. But I say this now, we don't know what's going to happen next. Um, none of us do. But if we can have moments like this and, and be able to kind of appreciate um, each other, I would, I, that's what I would tell my younger self. Well, when you find out how to do that, please teach me. Our last question is, um, is making movies hard? Making movies is really hard. Making movies takes every bit of will we have as uh, artists to get them through the process. And it, I always say it's not for the faint of heart. So if you ever change your podcast from making movies is hard to making movies is not for the faint of heart, you know, <laughs> you have my permission to use it, but, but <laughs> oh, so worth it, right? 
Awesome. So where should people find you, Terry? Like, do you have a website? Should you, they just go out and watch The Old Guard? Like, what should people do if they want to know well, more Well, I've you? been really fortunate lately to have uh, wonderful people like you who have wanted to hear my, hear my voice. So I would say that I am on social media at T.A. Schropp. As far as my webpage, trust me, during these COVID times and now that I have a little bit of time to, uh, to work on it, I, that's something I'm actually working on is my webpage. So when I have that, I will let you know. But in the meantime, you can find me tweeting a bit. I'm on Insta and uh, on your podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for you guys asking me. And I've had a chance to to listen to some of the things that you've done. And there's so much fun. And it's great. So keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. Thanks to Tara Lynn Schreier for being on the show. Um, Melissa, Natalie, and Christina from Netflix for setting up this interview. And if you haven't yet, go out and see The Old Guard now. Check out our website, makingmovesishard.com, where you can find links to everything we've talked about, including those amazing shorts we've been playing on Get Shorty. If you want to get in contact with us, send an email to podcast at makingmovesishard.com. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at MMIH Podcast. I am Liz Manischel on Twitter and Liz Manischel Film on Instagram. Ulrich, where are you? I am Ulrich B on Twitter and Instagram. And yeah. And don't forget about our YouTube page. Please subscribe. Leave a review on iTunes, Stitch, or Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. Finally, last but not least, thanks to our producers, Greg Holtzman, Joshua Sterling Bragg, editor Allison Stoney, the whole Bloodstream Media crew for making this episode possible. And we will talk to all y'all next week. Oh, God. How can I say this? (laughs) Oh, fuck. Okay. (laughs) Okay.